Thank you, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nisham Bhaskar from University of California, San Diego. And today I'll be presenting our work on evaluating the feasibility of physical layer BLE location tracking attacks on mobile devices. Uh, this paper is co-authored by Hadi Givechian and me. Um, unfortunately, he could not be here today, so, uh, but he'll feature in the slides. All right, so all our smart devices currently are constantly sending out Bluetooth beacons. And these beacons enable a whole host of features, for example, locating your lost devices or you know, even in recent times COVID-19 contact tracing. The number of beacons being sent out is quite a lot. That's the hundreds of beacons being sent out per minute. Unfortunately, this introduces a bit of a privacy risk because the, uh, and we envision a situation in which an attacker can actually uh, basically start, uh, capture these beacons using some device and then use those beacons to develop a fingerprint. And then following that, they can actually put that device at some other location, say your home, and then use that to constantly track as you go in and out of your home. So this sort of a privacy risk is definitely there with the BLE beacons. Now, to, to prevent against this sort of privacy risk at the Mac layer, there, there are provisions in place. So for instance, there was always a concern that the Mac address is a constant persistent identifier, and so Bluetooth introduced the concept of rotating Mac addresses. However, these protections actually uh, do not actually solve the complete problem because there's an underlying threat that still exists at the physical layer. Particularly, what can happen is an attacker can capture the actual wireless signal, raw signals, using an SDR, and then you can measure the distortions due to the hardware imperfections and use those as a fingerprint to track you. So what are these hardware imperfections that I speak of, right? And so the hardware imperfections are essentially due to the manufacturing variations that occur in the radio hardware. And here's a uh, diagram of a actual front-end uh, radio of uh, Bluetooth radio. And the hardware imperfections that we are particularly interested in are shown here. So for example, CFO is the carrier frequency offset that is due to the uh, PBM error of the oscillator crystal. You have IQ offset that is due to the carrier leakage onto the output and IQ imbalance due to the uh, way manufacturing variation in the I and Q chains. Now, what can happen is that if the attacker can measure these imperfections with great precision, they can use that as a fingerprint to track you. Now, there's been some work that has been done in Bluetooth to be able to uh, analyze these uh, imperfections, but they have generally have led to a very coarse estimate. So existing techniques have not been sufficient. But at the same time, there's been a lot of work that has uh, been done in other RF technologies like Wi-Fi. And in fact, if you look here, that this radio uh, is, is representative of a most common smart device wherein there is not a separate Wi-Fi or Bluetooth radio. There's one common one. And there have been techniques that have been developed to sort of uh, measure these properties for Wi-Fi radios. And so the question then comes up is that, well, you know, why can't we just use those same techniques for doing with Bluetooth uh, radios as well? Well, so the, the, the tricky thing about Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth uh, packets in general is the fact that they have a very short known sequence. What do I mean by that is that the fundamental premise of measuring these hardware imperfections requires us to have a bit of a known sequence or known set of bits as a reference against which I measure the received signal to sort of uh, measure the distortions. Um, and in Wi-Fi, primarily because of OFDM decoding, you actually need to have this sequence in place to be able to correct for that before even correctly decoding. And that's why you have this long sequence that allows you to sort of perform these measurements uh, easily. Unfortunately, in BLE, well, uh, you don't actually need to have a, such a long known sequence because even a coarse estimate of something like a CFO is sufficient to perform BLE decoding, right? And so the BLE known sequence is very few symbols in length. This actually makes uh, it very hard for us to use those symbols itself to do uh, an estimation of these parameters. However, so what we need as an attacker, if uh, what I would need is essentially to be able to use the entire payload or the entire packet as opposed to just those eight symbols. And so, well, there is an insight here, which is the fact that, well, we can utilize the entire packet of, as a known sequence. This is because, as I said previously, that Decoding does not actually depend on a good estimate of the CFO or something. So you can actually perform the decoding, actually get the, if you have received the packet correctly, you'll get all the bits and that gives you a complete reference signal which is as long as the entire packet itself. Now you can use that to actually do uh, more high precision estimates. So 
using the entire packet, what we do is like we actually created a uh, mechanism to estimate the imperfections, which is based on a sort of like an optimization approach. We model the entire system and uh, like an, in an optimized uh, and solve it as in an optimization approach, which is basically that we model the system with all its imperfections. We start with the clean signal, which is derived from the full packet, and then we iteratively introduce imperfections into it and to basically make it close to the received signal. And with this, we were able to actually achieve very uh, high precision uh, imperfection estimates. Um, so, and so this plot on the right actually shows uh, the, the yellow line actually is representative of uh, the uh, estimate done with only the eight bits of the preamble versus the estimates as we returned from our technique. And we see that the standard deviation in measuring CFO is significantly reduced. And plus, because we use all samples of the signal, there's an additional advantage that we reduce the impact of noise by sort of averaging across all the samples as well. So SNR impact is reduced. And so it is, as it clearly it is a bit feasible to actually get the fine-grained fingerprint from this uh, estimation technique. Now, the big question then comes up is that, okay, right, you can estimate the parameters, great, but then, you know, I take out these SDRs and try to do this physical tracking in the real world. In the real world, there are all sorts of things happen, right? If, I, if the wireless environment can change, I can go to a coffee shop, I can go to a library, I can be in the hallway. And physical environment, uh, physical parameters can also change. Say the temperature changes. How does this actually impact? Is it even feasible uh, to do this tracking? What are the challenges an attacker will face? So we tried to evaluate some of the challenges. The first one we came across was that, well, in the real world when you observe a lot of devices, a lot of devices actually have very close fingerprints. Um, and so what would happen is that um, there is a more likely chance in the real world of confusing them as opposed to some devices which have less uh, close fingerprints. Another thing that we observed is that these fingerprints or these estimated parameters are so, sort of dependent on the chipset. So in particular, uh, and so some chipsets have uh, across different uh, types of uh, radios have a wide variation in these parameters. But like in particular, there was this one type of chipset where we saw that they, were, they had absolutely no IQ offset. And this was actually the BLE only radios uh, seem to have no IQ offset because they have a completely different radio architecture. And this makes it particularly harder to sort of fingerprint them. Now, the second problem that an attacker may run into is that, well, you know, for one, carry frequency offset or frequency offset depends on the crystal and that drifts with temperature. And so what can happen is that as the phone activity sort of increases, as we can see on the plot on the left, there's a game that is being played, the frequency offset may change. And, and so would it also change when the ambient temperature changes. So for example, you put the phone in your pocket and you take it out and if there's a hot day or something, it can also be varied. And so this is also a challenge that an attacker would probably face. Given, however, in a lot of the conditions that we saw where we were performing this attack, we saw that for the most part, uh, in the common case, there would be a situation wherein like the phone is in your pocket or the phone is in your hand, right? Um, there are additional logistical challenges, and I call them logistical because it's more like how does the attacker like, you know, place the SDR. So for instance, the, as I, we realized that some smartphones have a much higher transmit power than other smartphones. And so uh, the, in that case, what would happen is the range is different, so you have to decide where to place your SDR. Now, the other thing that may happen is that the low-cost SDRs, if, you, if I want to use a low-cost SDR instead of a $2,000 USRP, that may actually have some imperfections of its own affect my measurement as well. And also, the, the target may be actually moving. It may not actually be stable. So then there could be things like Doppler effect. The last two uh, did, did not seem to have that much of an impact, and we uh, talked about uh, this a little bit more in the paper as well. Um, and the first one also, I mean, uh, the first one is, is more tricky, but like, yeah, I mean, uh, it's hard to sort of envision how to place the SDR that way. But then at the end of, with all these challenges in mind, the big question then comes up is, okay, do you have all these challenges? We have a good uh, way of estimating the parameters. How successful can an attacker be in the real world? All right. So to be able to be, to get into, before I get into that, I want to basically lay out what the tracking algorithm essentially does. Like, so we did the estimates of the hardware uh, imperfections. Then in the fingerprinting stage, we repeat this for like 50 packets per device and get a sort of a distribution. And then we take this distribution and for any, let's say we want to perform tracking, any packet that comes from an unknown device, we sort of try to see the statistical distance with respect to this distribution. And if it's within a certain threshold, we call it as that coming from that device. Um, these 50 and 10 packets, they are not magic numbers. Uh, we have detailed an experiment in the paper which actually tells how we got to these numbers. They seem to give us the best sort of uh, 
give us a high, there's a lowest number of packets for which you get a decent enough accuracy of tracking. And so I can present it now, we did a whole bunch of field experiments and there's a bit of an overview here, which is what we did was we took our SDR and went out into the field and collected BLE beacon data from uncontrolled mobile devices. We had no control over these devices. Uh, went to coffee shops, library, food courts. Uh, there was this huge facility where people were walking through. And in an analysis, we essentially answer three questions like how accurately can we actually track certain targets? Um, is, is, it, is the smart device actually distinguishable when there are hundreds and hundreds of devices? And how feasible is an actual tracking of a person? So to evaluate the first thing, which is the accuracy of tracking, what we did was we took a few smart devices, did a fingerprinting of them in an office environment on say day zero, then took these smart devices and the SDR to uh, a food court. And we basically put the SDR there and captured all BLE beacons from 50 other devices around. And the goal was simply that can the uh, SDR actually spot, can our tracking algorithm actually spot the devices? That gave us a sense of false negatives. For doing the false positives, what we did was we, we took the SDR to the coffee shop, did not take the targets. This coffee shop was 10 miles away, just I, that doesn't matter, but yeah. And uh, we collected a whole bunch of data from 50, 60 different devices, and we tried to analyze that if any of our targets you know, incorrectly showed up. And what we observed was that for across 17 distinct target devices, including smartphones, watches, laptops, we observed that the average uh, false positive and false negative ratio was significantly low, almost at like 3%. And most devices have uh, sort of, uh, have very low FPR and FNR, indicating they have somewhat distinguishable imperfection. Of course, there were some devices with a bit of outliers, right? And now, so, Keeping this in mind, we, uh, clearly it appears that a lot of devices are very uh, trackable, but then, okay, you might say that this is only 50 devices, right? What happens if there's like 200 devices or 300 devices around? Do, you, these, dis, do you, these distinguishing, uh, are these as distinguishable then? To evaluate that, what we did was, uh, we took our SDR and we put it at uh, the sort of a exit of a hall, uh, like exit of a room through which a number of people would pass during the day. It was almost like a moving queue. And so they would pass by the SDR for around a couple of minutes. And so we would see a lot of unique devices per day. So we did this for like two days, 10 hours a day. And uh, we captured around beacons from 647 devices. And all of these devices were predominantly smartphones because we specifically look for contact tracing beacons. And so what we did was then for each of these devices, we sort of calculated the average uh, CFO and IQ offset across all the packets that we received from the device. And we plotted a two dimensional histogram here of uh, the CFO and IQ offset of all these devices. The number of bins that have been chosen in this histogram is such that um, the size of the, bin, like I mean, the number of bins is significantly larger than the total number of devices. And the size of the bin is like, almost double the typical expected standard deviation for say CFO. And so basically what we are saying is that if say the, the color is blue, which means that there is no overlap, that means the device is perhaps distinguishable even in the sea of 600 devices. And we saw that even in this random collection of 650 devices almost, we 47.1% devices were comp had very distinct fingerprints and did not overlap with anything. And we saw another 15% devices that only had one overlap with some other thing, which basically means to say that even in out in the wild, in the real world situation, there's a lot of devices out there that have very distinguishable fingerprints, which sort of makes this tracking a, a real threat in some sense. And finally, like what would happen if I actually perform this sort of a tracking of a person, right? So we go back to that original video that we had and what happens in that situation? So uh, imagine a person, well, imagine the attacker actually fingerprinting uh, the victim's device at a particular location like an office, and then they put their SDR at the, at the home of this person wherein they go in and out. And so what we try to see if we can actually keep track of as the, uh, as the smart device is going in and out of the home, and what we observed that during the duration of about one hour, we were constantly running tracking instances every 10 seconds to see every 10 seconds if the person went in or out, if we detected it or not. And using that, we were able to get with pretty high accuracy, detect when the person was going in and out of their homes, even in the presence of almost 30 to 40 devices always around. So this actually makes it seem that this actually shows that tracking is actually feasible in very much real world situations and even in the presence of uh, sort of other devices around. 
Now, finally, there are some certain possible defenses that to this tracking, right, to this vulnerability, and which is basically that uh, you can, uh, what can happen is to be able to solve this problem, one can do is like they can add hardware or firmware modifications to add sort of a time varying CF4 IP offset that could perhaps confuse the attacker when they try to fingerprint them or track them. Um, and then there is this other idea which is, which is less, okay, it's, uh, you can actually have a software that runs a time varying computation that causes temperature changes, but well, that will really kill your battery. Um, the first idea is, seems more reasonable, but yeah, it, it requires some implementation as future work. So to conclude, basically for many smart devices, we've seen that physical liability tracking is definitely a real threat in, in, this, in the world. And a number of real world devices have very distinguishable imperfections and therefore are vulnerable to this sort of an attack. And I, I'd like to thank you from both the victim and the attacker. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. Oops. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time, plenty of time for questions, but please head to the mic so people online can hear. Hi. This is Daniel Antonioli from Eurocom. Uh, thanks. This is great work. Uh, I was wondering if your tracking algorithm depends also on the frequency hopping scheme that is used by BLE. Are you taking into account the fact that the frequency changes or not? So uh, basically what we are looking at is purely a beacon packet. So there are, uh, this is uh, in the advertisement stage. So this is like a Yeah, we have three advertisement channels. Three, we have three advertisement channels, and yes. Are you focusing on a single channel or you are So it, no, our algorithm is independent of the channel. We definitely do uh, keep track of which channel it is. So of course we have to um, uh, keep track of that. But yeah, the algorithm itself does not uh, necessarily depend on the channel. Okay, and uh, regarding the use case, and you, I think you tracked uh, beacons uh, um, from contact tracing apps. Yes. But if you change the use case, let's say that there is a different type of advertisement with different type of advertising scheme and data, do you think that you can reuse the same algorithm or you have to adapt the algorithm to track uh, someone? Um, um, I don't fully get by data you mean. Okay, uh, so we actually did not only limit ourselves to contact tracing. Contact okay. tracing was the more recent experiments we did after the pandemic. We actually started this pre-pandemic and so uh, that initial 17 target experiment, a lot of it was actually using the Apple continuity uh, framework. So you okay. know those beacons that you use to hand off. So um, the, the actual packet content of the beacons is immaterial. Uh, I mean, it does not uh, matter so much to us. Um, the only thing that we use from the packet content really is the MAC address and we only use that as a label. So for instance, I want to get 50 packets from a device. At any instant of time, I know that, you know, even if it's a random address, if it's there's 50 packets from one device, that label, that is one device. So that's really the only information I use. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I'm Suryadev from Penn State and before I ask my question, uh, I admit that it could really sound stupid, but um, there's probably something okay. that I've misunderstood, but um, when BLE is advertising itself, uh, essentially in the advertisement, a unique identifier is encoded. And you are doing this at the physical level, right? So uh, I'm, I kind of fail to see the challenge in this because uh, it seems to me that whatever uh, you know, whatever you're sensing physically would essentially be analogous to the unique identifier itself. Okay, yeah. Um, I, so, I, I'm not sure I got that. Uh, like, uh, is your concern that, like, you, uh, the, the challenge part, like, what, what was difficult about doing yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, the, so, the actual sensing and estimation of these parameters itself, um, you can estimate the parameters with anything, but the estimation of the parameters depends essentially on the number of samples you use in the estimate, right? So it's like, it's like uh, you get a much uh, better estimate or a much uh, you know, tighter distribution of the estimate if you have many more samples. The problem with the traditional, uh, and by samples I mean, what you need to know is you need to know some part of the signal that is sort of known so let's say there's a sequence 0101, zero, you know that as is. And then uh, versus, and you compare that against what you actually get and that's how you sort of uh, estimate these parameters. Uh, 
Um, originally in Bluetooth, the big problem was that the, the, the only known sequence in most, uh, most communication is preamble. Mm -hmm. uh, preamble is extremely short in Bluetooth, and because of that short duration, uh, the typical techniques that we use for calculating these parameters, like the things that we could use in, say, Wi-Fi or something, they do not actually give you great, great estimates. And so the problem is like, uh, when you have to do tracking, and when I have to do tracking in the sense that I want to be able to distinguish th hundreds of thousands of devices, every little difference that I have simply because of my measurement error makes a huge difference as an attacker because I will start confusing everything. Of course, if I have like five or 10 devices, it's perhaps less of a concern. Okay, so yeah, that does answer my question. Yeah. Thank you. Time for maybe one quick question. Okay, so um, I'm Serge from uh, EPFL. Uh, about contact tracing, the privacy protection used to be quite controversial, so I was wondering if you reported your results to Apple and Google. So, uh, so this is particularly, uh, I think we have, uh, we have actually talked to them, but uh, we have informed them what we're doing, but the thing is that we're not actually, in particular, violating contact tracing privacy. What we are showing that beyond just contact tracing itself. So contact tracing is just one of the applications that is a concern here. Actually, our phones are sending out, at this point, the number of beacons they're sending out is even beyond contact tracing, there's a huge number. So it's mostly about like BLE devices sending out these beacons. So contact tracing, yes, is one application where there's a concern. More importantly to our point is that um, we, um, in, in terms of like the ethics of the thing, we actually have no identifiable information. At best, we can uh, identify a particular device. Um, I have actually, unless somebody tries specifically to identify the, the person, I have no identifiable information about the person themselves. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I do not have a good answer to that question, but uh, I think we have, Definitely, uh, we, we, we have talked to them about this, but yeah, I mean, it's it's mostly in the <coughs> sense that there is no direct identification of any individual. And to that end, I would agree with the contact tracing. The privacy preserving mechanism does ensure that we cannot actually track any specific individual easily. Even this attack would require a very, a bit of a skilled uh, person to, and <laughs> even pre this, this attack was valid even pre-contact tracing. This was nothing to specifically do with contact tracing because we used to do it for even using straight up Apple continuity beacons. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, why don't we thank the uh, Shant again.